ridiculous. Okie doke. Let's shrink that down to, whoops. There we go. Put that down there. So thank you for joining me. Oh, there we go. Thank you for joining me for Tips in 20. Let me make sure we're on track. 8.03, a little bit of a late start, but I do apologise for that. Um, so yeah, tools and strategies on how to thrive in a life altered by your child's disability diagnosis or additional needs. I'm so sorry if you've attended every Tips in 20 that I've done because you're going to know what's coming next. And that is just a very quick introduction. But I am conscious that we get uh, new people coming in or watching this at a later date. So I am your host tonight, Charlie Beswick. I am mum to Oliver and Harry. And this is Harry on the screen here. Um, Harry was born with golden heart syndrome, which effectively means half of his face hadn't formed in the womb. Um, and he's also got autism. So my boys are 17, but Harry functions around about four or five. I am the best-selling author of our book, Our Altered Life. I'm also mentor to mums like myself and an advocate to parent carers in the workplace. I am a charity founder of More Than A Face and I go into schools educating children and young people about visible difference. And I am a cheeseaholic and gin lover. I don't know why I put that last. That's, it's like I'm super proud of those sort of things. So that's me. And our session this week is sponsored actually for the last... Uh, two sessions and one more to go um, by Flamingo Chicks, which is an amazing organisation, a charity um, based down south, but they've got different sort of pods all over the country and they are all about inclusion through dance. So please do check out Flamingo Chicks because they are doing wonderful things. So this week's session is going to be about something that is, I'm really um, excited to get stuck into this. It's dealing with the opinions of other people. Uh, and it's something that when I am mentoring mums, it, it crops up a lot. But as always, I'd like to really touch very briefly on the history to give some sort of context to the issues that we've got. So why? Why do we even care so much about the opinion of other people? First of all, evolutionary benefits. So when we lived in tribes or herds or groups, it was really about survival that you fit in community. Um, and so it was really important that we had their approval and that we had their, um, their blessing, if you like. So that led to personal and social approval. The self-esteem and self-worth is very tied and very linked to having that approval as a bit of a byproduct. Um, and it also serves as a bit of a behaviour barometer, if you like. So if we feel shame, for example, if I've been caught cheating in an exam, that kind of keeps me on the straight and narrow, you'd think. Um, or, you know, if I'm embarrassed because I've been drunk at a party and swearing profusely, you know, so also, you know, the opinions of others can keep us in line. Some would say conforming. So there's a grey area there. But there are lots of benefits, but it comes at a bit of a high price. Ooh. Next. I feel like Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. So opinions that we encounter can be unhelpful. For example, oh, well, when my child didn't sleep, I just did this. I just gave them hot milk and off they, off they went. Eight hours straight. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. <laughs> Apologies to Karen. They can be unwanted. So, you know, just give him a smack. In my day, you know, didn't do me any harm. Yep, thanks, Grandad. And they can just be downright unkind. You know, the tutting, the huffing, the puffing. Um, so it, it can be really challenging. And the source of those opinions can make impacts for different reasons. So if it's a stranger that's passing judgment, as it feels at the time, this often has an impact because it's embarrassing. It's usually in public, unless you're used to having strangers around the house, I'm not. Um, so it's usually you know, in public, there's lots of eyes on you. It's often a one-off experience, but it's big enough to stay in your memory. So if anybody's ever been publicly shamed, I can guarantee you'll know where you were, what you were wearing, how you felt before, during and after. It really becomes very imprinted and ingrained on us. So it has that impact because it's really high stakes. Professionals, so the opinions of professionals can really leave uh, an impact and a bit of a legacy because it can be, feel quite intimidating. So it can almost make us feel very small, very childlike, because those people 
have got some element of control over the decisions that the decisions that help us so that can often feel quite threatening at times to to really want to argue back with those opinions it's almost like you're arguing with authority so that can leave a, a bit of an impact and family and friends the impact there is that it can be regular and ongoing and it's personal because they know you it can feel really personal and, and so it can sometimes feel like a very personal attack so Lots of different ways that we are impacted by opinions for lots of different reasons. Um, my mum, bless her, love my mum, but she will every now and again <laughs> rear her head and suggest we go gluten-free because she's read that gluten-free is great for autistic children. And I'll have to have those conversations with her, which I'll you know, sort of uh, mention later on. But because it's family and friends, you sometimes feel a bit awkward and it's regular and it's consistent. So it just comes with different challenges than either a professional or a stranger in the street. But either way, with any of those scenarios, there are a few things to remember. So the first thing to remember is that their view is about them and not you. So when you and I could go to the cinema together, I could come out thinking this was the best film I've ever seen. And you could come out thinking it was a pile of rubbish. Because to any situation, we take our own expectations, our own upbringing, our own um, you know, experiences, our own stereotypes, our own cultural beliefs. All of those things impact what we are seeing and how we interpret that. So, for example, you know, I've, I've put an image there of a young girl screaming, holding on to a shopping trolley. Okay? Everybody's nightmare when your child goes into meltdown in the middle of Sainsbury's. Other supermarkets are available. Um, but if I was to see this child, I might think, oh, crikey, she's having a meltdown, that poor mum, is there anything I can do? No, it's probably better that I leave her to it and just don't stare. That might be my experience. Stereotypically, an older generation might think, naughty child, need to go smack on the behind, never did me any harm, as I've just sort of mentioned earlier. And then somebody else who's never encountered children with learning needs might just think, well, she's a naughty girl. You know, and, and so the way that we interpret things is so massively influenced by what we bring to the table that we can't control. I can't go into the Sainsbury's and control the way a hundred people are looking at me and Harry. So what's the point in me even trying? And I don't mean that in a defeatist way. I mean that as in an empowering way. OK, so their view is about them. It's not about you. The second thing is that we need to accept that we will be judged we are judged constantly and newsflash you will have judged somebody at some time or another I have I know I have doesn't make me you know I'm not proud of that but we do it automatically often without thinking it's part of life okay people are judging each other's outfits whether that's complimentary or not they're judging their decisions they're judging their behaviors accents all different types of things okay so it's just part of our human makeup so just get used to the fact that we are going to be judged and actually if you are somebody that is never judged i'm going to throw this out there here if you are someone who is loved unanimously by the crowd okay i would suggest that you're probably not being your authentic bit of cringe world self i would suggest that you are possibly being a bit of a people pleaser because if you've got an, not an opinion, there's going to be somebody that disagrees with you. If you're saying that black is black, there's going to be somebody that comes across and says, oh, actually, is it or is it shade of grey? I don't think it's black. I think it's called midnight sadness or something like that. OK, think colour wall charts. But my point is, if you aren't sharing your opinion, if everybody loves you, then are you really voicing yourself? OK, it's just something to think about. But you will be judged. And your self-worth is not determined by someone else's opinion. I've mentioned this a few times. You might have heard me say this before, but similarly to the, the supermarket analogy, if I'm delivering a public speech, I can stand on stage to 100 people. I can deliver the same talk to 100 people. 50 of those people might think I'm brilliant. OK, 25 might just have hated it. 20 might have been a little bit bored and zoned out five just couldn't tolerate me because they hate my accent or i remind them of their daughter-in-law who they hate or something like that that you know somebody at school that bullied them so but that doesn't change who i am and what i'm worth 
because again, I can't control their opinions. So your self-worth is actually not determined by what other people think. It's determined by what you think. Um, you know, if you ask Piers Morgan, he's like the best person in the world. So narcissism playing into that can be dangerous. But I have no doubt that we have no narcissists in this group um, and watching this replay. So really get used to the fact that judgment is a part of life. And the fact that people may judge you, will judge you, it's going to happen, okay, is just part of the world. And it doesn't mean that you are a bad person. It's much more a reflection on what they, how they are seeing that situation, the lenses that they're putting on. So there are a few things that you can do. Okay, this is the, this is the crux of everything, really. And we are really doing well for time. So when you are in a situation or you're going to, you're approaching a situation let's say you know somewhere out in public if you've got a child that's struggling particularly during school holidays when they've lost their structure decide what matters before you go out what's the most important thing if harry's having a meltdown to me the most important thing is his safety i remember a little old lady coming over in sainsbury's when he was lying on the floor doing his ninja turtle impression when he spins on his back and kicks everybody and she, she came over to try and help me. And I could see in slow motion him kicking her leg. So I kind of pushed her back gently. And I, so for me, his, his safety and her safety were really important. That's all that mattered to me. I didn't care the manager came over. I didn't care that people were staring as long as they were safe. So it's about priorities. Is it your priority that you go and get the weekly food shop for your family? Okay, if you're gonna do that and your child needs to sit in the trolley, your big child, that's fine. It doesn't matter. What you need to do is get the weekly shop. Okay, so it's really about giving yourself a purpose, having a reason to be going out there, something that's bigger than the opinions of other people. Second thing is a phrase, and hopefully you'll, you'll jot this down, they may think, all right? So it's followed by, so they may think, let's say I'm a bad mum. All right. Or he's a naughty boy is a common one. All right. They, they may think that my son's a naughty boy. We follow that with, but others know, and you can even choose somebody, but my sister knows that he's actually just autistic. So it might be, they may think that I'm a terrible mum, but friends know that I adore my kids. They may think that I've got no control over my children, but Harry's teacher knows that this is how he deals with public situations. So that's twofold. That helps us to separate their opinion from the moment. And it reminds us that it's not always about us. Okay, so they may think that, but actually other people know. Thinking and knowing are two different things. Thinking is, is just based on their experiences and knowing is based on the facts. So we're anchoring in, we're reminding ourselves that actually they can think what they like, but the people that matter the people that are in our lives regularly, they know different. And so they, they may think X, Y, Z, but others know. So just write that down and just have a think about that if this is something that resonates for you. Don't mind read. How many times do we think, oh, they must think I'm terrible, particularly with healthcare and education professionals. I remember when Harry was, we were having some trouble getting Harry's transport arranged always a dilemma and a trauma and I was dealing with one particular head of services and she refused to speak to me on the phone <laughs> in the end because I was like a squeaky wheel so I rang and I rang and I remember thinking god they must think I'm an absolute pain in there Beep! and do you know what they probably did but good because those people are the ones that get answers to shut them up uh, and Harry's transport was sorted and again Harry, decide what matters Harry's transport is what matters if I'm going to put her opinion over Harry's rights, I'm not going to get anywhere. So for me, in that moment, it, you know, it didn't serve me to sit there and worry about what she thought of me. And actually, she's probably got 100 and other, 101 other parents. So often we'll mind read and it's completely unwarranted anyway. So just try not to or remind yourself, I'm not a mind reader. I am not a mind reader. OK, often we worry about things that just don't need to be worried about. Proactive conversations really is, is more the realm of family and friends. So I talked earlier about the opinions that and the impact that that makes. 
So if you know that you're going to have or you have a particular person that has a tendency to bring things up, and I'm going to return back to mum and gluten free here, then it's really good to have these proactive conversations outside of that moment. So when, um, you know, when everything's calm or in a different time, I would say to mum, listen, I know you're only trying to help me and I appreciate it. But when you tell me to go to, that I've got to go gluten free, it panics me. It makes me feel like I'm letting Harry down or it makes me feel like I've got to change everything about him or everything about his diet at school and at his dad's and I can't control those and it puts loads of pressure on me and actually it changes the way I deal with you and I don't want it to impact our relationship because I love you okay similarly if it was a work colleague it might be let's say um <laughs> thinking on the spot uh, I know you're exhausted because Bethany isn't sleeping but when you tell me that you've been up twice in the night it makes me feel really quite narky because I'm up like eight or nine times and it doesn't take away from your sleep deprivation but it makes me feel a bit arsy and I don't want it changing our dynamic because I really respect you and I really really like you but I'm just putting it out there so you know. So again, that has a couple of different, it serves a couple of different purposes. A, it's out of context so that you haven't got the heat of the emotion at the time. And B, you're saying it makes me feel, not you make me feel. Because when, as soon as we say, when you say Bethany doesn't sleep, you make me feel like a failure. It feels like a personal attack and people will automatically get their backs up and go on the defensive. So we're talking about the language they use or the thing that they do or the behaviour that they're showing. That's the thing that triggers you, not them personally. So again, this can sometimes take a little bit of getting your head around. So jot it down if this is something that you think, oh, I quite like that idea, but I'm not sure how it would work for me. OK, so I'll go back to my little script here. So I know you're trying to help me when you say or do whatever, but it makes me feel X, Y and Z. And I don't want that in our relationship because I love you or I respect you or I enjoy working with you okay? and just put it out there for people. Um, swap should for could. This is a huge one. So the amount of times that we think, oh, I should be a Pinterest mom. I should be baking with the kids. I should be a stay at home mom. I should be a working mom. I should be contributing more. The list is endless. OK, swap should for could, swap the S for the C. What should brings to the conversation is a lot of judgment and fear from other people. So if we're saying I should be doing something, it tends to mean that we feel under pressure to do it. If we change that, just that one word to I could, it gives us options, it gives us choice. So instead of I should be baking with the kids, well, I could be baking with the kids, but actually they don't enjoy it. <laughs> or we did go out for the full day yesterday and now I'm knackered so I'm just gonna have a chill day or but we're gonna do some colouring in later it kind of opens up our mind and allows us to think a little bit more creatively than should which shuts us down because we feel under pressure and we feel attacked so you know I could be a stay-at-home mom but actually I enjoy going to work two days a week and, and chatting with other adults that that works for me or I could if I'm a stay-at-home mom I could be a working mom but actually my priority at the moment is being here for the children. So could just gives you those options. Stock phrases are really, again, something to write down, really powerful, particularly with professionals. Um, and so these are just phrases that basically replace the phrase, you're wrong. Okay, when we want to just say, nope, you're wrong. There are different ways of doing that, which means we can be assertive without being aggressive. So we can say things like, um, okay fair enough but I don't see that with Harry or I don't see that with my child or it could be um right okay well I'm sure that's great for them or that worked for them but I don't think it will work for Harry or oh yeah actually I did try that one with Harry but it didn't get me anywhere um, or melatonin so melatonin conversation I've said before people Mel get, give him melatonin give him melatonin give yeah we've tried melatonin it sent him hyper it didn't help him at first but thanks anyway. Um, and then if all else fails, I'll give it some thought. So that's what you're doing in your mind when you're thinking about this. 
So it's just worth having those little stop phrases so that when you're on the spot, if you feel under pressure and you want to say no, or do you know what, you're wrong. And, I, you, know, and you can say those things, by the way. You have got permission to say no. No is a, it's a full sentence on its own. Um, and often you don't need to justify yourself. But I know that lots of people, particularly around professionals, can feel quite intimidated. So if that's the case, just write down or Google ways to say you're wrong or ways to say not for me, no thank you, and just see what comes up so that you've got a little bit of preparation behind you. A fifth sandwich is what you heard me refer to during the proactive conversations. So it's good, bad, good, positive, negative, positive. So with my mum, mum, I love you. Um, I, I know that you're really thinking of Harry, but you're driving me bonkers. <laughs> I do love you. All right, so it's you kind of sandwiching the bad news in between the good ones. So it could be, you know, let's use a professional, for example, a teacher. I know you've been teaching for 20 years and you know your kids super, super well. But in our situation, Harry really needs X, Y and Z. Next bit. And I respect you as a teacher, but the methods you're using so far haven't worked for him. So we've got a lot of acknowledgement that wraps around the, the core that you're getting to. So a sandwich is a really, really good technique in any situation. Feel free to use it with your partners, with your kids, in any sort of context. It's very, it's really, it can be really powerful because it doesn't just feel like you're delivering bad news. You're ending on a little bit of a, a high note and you're preparing them, you're warming them up nicely, but you've got the crux of the argument there in between. And if all else fails, Adding distance when there's a toxic relationship isn't ever nice, it's never pleasant, but sometimes it's necessary. Um, and sometimes that needs a conversation and sometimes it just doesn't. You know, I've had to add distance to friendships, um, not so much to relationships, uh, like with family. I've been quite fortunate in that respect, probably because of my divorce, because um, my mother-in-law and I wouldn't have seen eye to eye along the road, so <laughs> uh, over Shara. Um, so yeah, there has to be some distance at times and only you know when the right time is to do that. So, send and cheese if you are not a part of it is our incredibly beautiful community. It's good for the soul, so that's sharing our altered lives together and it is a community on Facebook, so do look for send and cheese, answer the questions and join us. And what I don't remind people about, and I don't know why I don't do this, is that I am actually mentoring mums as well. So if you want a free 30 minute consultation with me about how you want to move forward and just get a little bit of clarity and confidence about parenting, then do let me know and we can arrange that. So what questions do you have? We have got about ooh, seven or eight minutes left. So if you have any questions, I'm just going to come off screen share stop sharing there we go if you do have any questions now is the time to give me a shout um okay so that was helpful i don't know how to start a conversation and get upset yeah because it's really emotive it's real you don't want to be upsetting people you don't want to be causing you know arguments but if you can do it in a calm time and, and say that you know address the elephant in the room do you know what? I, I don't know how to start this and I don't want to get upset, but can I just share something with you, please? I love you or I respect you or we get on, whoever it is, I don't know. There's this and it makes me feel, not you, it makes me feel this way. And I know you mean it well, but it's stinging me a little bit. Okay. Um, need some of these techniques at the moment, brilliant. And the replay will come out. Please do let me know if you're not getting this in the email because it will come out as a replay. So if I've talked too fast or you've not taken notes, um, you can always watch it back afterwards. Um, anybody's got any other questions? I am happy to answer them or any feedback. Um, and if not, then we will shut up shop. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Okay, great. If anybody wants to private message me, um, I am available at info at ouralteredlife.com. So you can contact me that way. Um, and yeah, thank you for joining me. I do hope it's been helpful and useful. I am trying to keep them short, sharp and, and sweet. Um, so um, I hope that's helped. And I will see you next month for Christmas talk in November. But we're just talking about Christmas when your child has additional needs. And then in December, we're going to set ourselves up for a really good 2023. So do join me for, for those as well. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, guys. And I will see you next month. Take care. Bye.